Good day, viewers. Welcome to Kalusugan ay Karapatan. I am Dr. Menjit Padilla, and today's topic is very timely and relevant. The world we once knew is being disrupted by this invisible enemy, the virus SARS-CoV-2, or commonly known as COVID-19. In late December 2019, a new coronavirus, now known as SARS-CoV-2, was identified as the cause of an outbreak of acute respiratory illness in Wuhan, Hubei province of China. We saw through January that this spread through China with sporadic global cases throughout the world. In January 2020, the first case of COVID-19 was reported by the Department of Health in a Chinese national with travel history to Wuhan. And by January 30, 2020, the WHO declared a world health emergency. Everything changed for the Philippines in early March 2020, when the first local transmission of COVID-19 was confirmed. An increase in number of COVID-19 cases ensued prompting the declaration of the state of public health emergency throughout the Philippines, placing the whole of Luzon and some parts of the country under community quarantine. As of May 5 of this year, there have been 9,684 confirmed cases of the disease with 1,408 recoveries and 637 deaths. The Philippines has the third most number of cases in Southeast Asia after Singapore and Indonesia. Worldwide, there are over 3.5 million confirmed cases with 243,540 deaths. To appease the fears and anxieties and root out misinformation brought about by the disease, it is my pleasure to introduce our resource person, Dr. Marisa Alejandria, a professor of the UP College of Medicine and president of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, to give us an overview of this virus, SARS-CoV-2, and the disease COVID-19. Good day, um, Dr. Marisa Alejandria, or Dr. Isa. Good morning, Chansey Menchit. Well, thank you for joining us uh, in this uh, episode. And uh, we're all looking forward to knowing more about the coronavirus. So let's start the conversation. What is coronavirus? Coronavirus is a family of virus that causes our common colds and uh, newly emerged uh, infectious disease na kumakalat ngayon sa buong mundo, ang COVID-19. And it is also the cause of uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or yung tawag na MERS, that emerged in 2012, and Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which emerged in 2002. This virus is a single-strand RNA virus that infects mammals such as cattle, camels, cats, and birds. This family muna, is... Uh, Dr. Isa, na, na, napakalaki pala nitong family. It's, you're saying that coronavirus is the cause of common colds. Yes. So, ipag-usapan natin muna yung common colds. So, yeah, no? Because uh, common colds is something that's uh, very common among the general population. And you are saying now that the coronavirus that we're talking about is in the same family. Yeah. So can you tell us about this family? Napakalaki, sabi mo, my MERS, my SARS, but now we're talking about COVID-19. So can you at least give us the difference between the different uh, coronaviruses? So under this family, there are four children or four genera, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. Yung alpha and beta coronavirus, ito yung nag infect ng humans. And these are the ones that cause the uh, respiratory infection. Uh, yung common cold, the, this one falls under the four human coronavirus na we see in everyday uh, occurrence. No? It's uh, endemic globally. And it is the one responsible for 10 to 30% of upper respiratory tract infection in adults. So 
alam naman natin na lahat sa atin dito nakadanas na ng sipon. And that is caused by the coronavirus. Ngayon, yung, meron din siyang uh, isang genus or kapamilya, yung beta coronavirus. Dito magpo-fall yung MERS coronavirus at yung SARS coronavirus. At yung pinakabago natin ngayon na virus dito sa pamilya na to ang SARS-CoV-2. Itong tatlo na to ay nag-originate from animals. And uh, based on genetic sequences, mukhang galing sila sa bats or yung paniki. So, kaya tinatawag na zoonotic kasi nag-transmit siya from animals to man. So, nag-emerge, tinatawag din natin silang emerging infectious disease. So, nangyayari yan pag uh, yung virus nagkakaroon ng spillover event, no? yung virus na nasa animal, so kagaya nitong SARS, MERS, tsaka SARS-CoV-2, uh, sila ay na-transmit yung SARS from cats to human, yung MERS-CoV naman from camel to human. Yung SARS-CoV-2, hindi pa klaro kung saan talaga, ano yung naging intermediate host from bats. Tapos, uh, kung... Naalala nyo sa Wuhan Seafood Market, doon sinasabi nga na doon nagmula yung SARS-CoV-2. Pwedeng so, doon sa mga uh, so, seafood Isa. animals doon sa yeah. market. Yeah. Sa so, so, Dr. Isa, um, parang napaka-popular kasi ngayon ng COVID-19. Ano? Parang hindi naman ganun ka-popular yung MERS at saka SARS. Um, is there any reason for, for this? Um, for this... Uh, uh, the differences in its uh, presentation? Yung MERS kasi, uh, nagmula siya sa camel. So, wala siya dito sa atin. Tapos, uh, ang pinagmula niya sa Middle East. Okay. Yung SARS, na-experience natin yan noong 2002. Kasi, uh, yun yung time na madalas na rin ang travel, no? mabilis na rin ang travel noon. So, na transmit siya dito sa Pilipinas through, uh, if I remember right, it was a nurse na nag-travel from Canada to our country. So during ang SARS, naging pandemic yan. No? Nag-spread din across the uh, globe. Pero uh, hindi siya kasing dilis ng SARS-CoV-2 ang pag-spread niya. Sige, so pag-usapan natin ngayon ng COVID-19, ano? So, uh, unang-una, sabi mo nga ay travel is so crucial, no? Dahil sa travel become more, uh, is it like a bit game more accessible, then uh, we were able to to move the virus across the world. So, pag-usapan natin ang ngayon ang COVID-19. Um, Ang sabi mo nga, walang camel, kaya parang hindi nauso yung ibang mga viruses. So let's go straight to COVID-19 now. So what else do you want our viewers, viewers to learn about COVID-19? Tura, oh. i-explain ko lang. No? Yung SARS-CoV-2, yun yung virus itself na ang nag-cause ng COVID-19. COVID-19 ang tawag natin dun sa this respiratory infection that caused the virus, uh, that, that caused the uh, disease. So, SARS-CoV-2 yung virus, ang respiratory infection ay yung COVID-19. Okay. So, ano ba itong COVID-19 natin? No? So, paano siya nagsisimula? So, it usually starts as a mild illness which can progress to moderate, severe, or a critical phase. But, pero, 80% no, is mild to moderate, 15% severe, 5% is critical. So, anong mga symptoms no? Sa mild, ang nakikita natin sa mild ay para lang siyang upper respiratory tract infection. So, merong fever, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty of breathing. Pwede ring may muscle pain, myalgia, parang flu, no? Except na dito sa COVID-19, wala masyadong sipon kumpara sa flu. Tapos ang iba pang mga simptomas, headache, sore throat, yung iba, napapansin nila na nawawala yung kanilang 
uh, pangamoy o panglasa. So yun yung mild type ng uh, COVID-19. Yung moderate naman, yun na yung nagkakaroon ng hirap ng paghinga, mas lumalala yung ubo, at uh, ito, pag in ray meron ng makikita ang pneumonia. Tapos, uh, yung severe naman, mas lumalala yung hirap ng paghinga hanggang sa kuminsan, magiging kailangan na silang ilagay sa ICU dahil kailangan nilang ma-respirator. Meron din ang mga kailangan na rin silang madialysis. So, ito yung critical stage na uh, COVID-19. Dr. Isa, ang sabi mo nga ay yung symptoms. So, um, can you tell us a little about the, again about the spread para makaiwas ang ating mga uh, viewers uh, from getting this disease? So, uh, can you tell us uh, how um, it, it spreads from uh, the one person to another? Okay. Uh, paano, siya, paano tayo nahahawa? No? Paano natin nakukuha itong virus na ito? Uh, it's mostly spread from person to person among close contacts. So kung na-expose tayo within 3 to 6 feet to someone who is carrying the virus, pwede tayong mahawa. Sa papanong paraan, no? uh, the spread occurs mainly via respiratory droplets, no? pag umubo or suminga, maching. No? So yung when a person coughs or sneezes, similar to how uh, we get flu. No? So nagkakaroon ng droplets. Pag ubo natin, lumalabas yung virus. Kasama nung ubo or yung pagsinga. And tapos kung merong tao na malapit sa sa'yo within 3 or 6 feet, then that person can inhale the virus into his lungs. So yun yung paraan kung paano natin nakukuha ang uh, virus na ito or itong SARS-CoV-2. Tapos kung uh, pag-ubo mo, yung ibang uh, microbial or yung virus, uh, it drops into the table or into the uh, surfaces no, sa computer, tapos hinawakan mo yon at hinawakan mo ang iyong muka, then there's a possibility that uh, that virus can also enter through your nose or in and enter into your respiratory tract. So yun ang mode of transmission na tinatawag natin for COVID-19. So, so Dr. Isa, ito yung basis kung bakit uh, uh, in-advise ang social distancing or physical distancing dahil sabi mo nga ay na, na, na ililipat mo no, sa pagbahing. So napaka-importante talaga ng part na yan na i-maintain natin yung physical distancing. Yung sinabi mo kasi, how many feet kapag bumahing ang tao? Ulitin nga natin, kapag bumabahing ang tao, papano, uh, kalayo pwedeng makarating itong droplets na ito? 3 to 6 feet. Within 3 to 6 oh. feet, pwede oh, dapat, uh, i-travel ng virus. Okay. Napangkit mo rin kasi na kunyari ikaw ay uh, bumahing at umbo at napunta sa surface. So, so dapat talaga pala laging malinis din ang ating paligid. Kaya uh, yung ba ang basis din kung bakit tayo pinapayuhan ngayon na tayo nakamask para kung saling tayo ay ano hindi makakarating sa si ibang tao ang virus or ang droplets o kaya hindi sila mapupunta sa ating mga workplace, sa ating mga mesa, yung ba ang dahilan? Yes, that's one way to prevent the spread of the virus. No? So you know, we advise uh, the public to wear mask. Tapos din kasi, uh, there is what we call a pre-symptomatic period dito sa virus na to, no? What is this pre-symptomatic period? Parang two days before you experience symptoms, you are actually shedding the virus already. And pwede ka nang makahawa. Although, ang main driver of transmission talaga ay yung may symptoms, yung mga inuubo. So para ma-cover yung part na yun na tinatawag na pre-symptomatic period, yung period na actually kung isan, parang akala mo wala kang nararamdaman, Pero meron ng konti. And usually, pinab binabaliwala natin yun. Eh. Parang, parang masama yung pakiramdam. Pero hindi pa talagang yung ihihiga mo. At that point, 
pwede ka nang nagsished ng virus. Kaya ang advice is really to uh, physical distance and then wear mask. Always wash our hands no? after every activity para nga maiwasan na mahawa tayo. Tapos uh, yung symptoms, no? kung ikaw ay na-expose sa isang uh, may virus, pwede siya mag-start 2 days up to 14 days after mo ma-expose to the virus or an average of 5 to 6 days. Yan yung... Uh, isa na, na, oh, Doctor, isa napakahalaga nun kasi alam mo kadalasan uh, kapag masama ang pakiramdam natin at binabaliwa, binabaliwala natin, ang sinasabi natin ay pagod lang. No? But what you're saying now, in the current situation na meron tayo talagang pandemic dito sa Pilipinas, hindi natin dapat binabaliwa, bin, binabaliwala itong mga nararamdaman natin to. Dapat talagang magpahinga na. Tama ba yon? Yes. Lalo na kasi yung characteristic nitong virus na to, uh, it's highly infectious starting two days before you actually have the symptoms. And uh, within the first week. So yun yung kaibahan niya kasi sa SARS at sa mers Yung symptoms niya, just dun pa sa second week talaga nagiging highly infectious. Ito, sa simula pa lang, highly infectious na yun yung stage. Eh, yun yung time na hindi mo masyadong binibigyan ng pansin eh. Yung nararamdaman mong ubo. Kaya, mas mabilis siyang kumalat. Mas mabilis ang pagkalat niya. Kumpara sa SARS at mers cov At uh, nakita rin, nung inaral nga yung mga kaso sa China, na mataas ang kanyang reproductive rate o yung tinatawag na transmission efficiency. Kano siya kabilis ma-transfer, no? So for every person that is infected with the virus, you can infect two to four persons kaagad. And then that two to four persons can infect another two to four persons. So kaya kung makita natin yung uh, pagkalat nitong SARS-CoV-2, so very steep yung curve compared sa SARS na it took uh, eight months to infect 8,000 people versus itong uh, SARS na in one month ang dami na niyang na-infect kaagad dun sa nung inaral yung uh, transmission dynamics nitong SARS-CoV-2 sa China. Pero Dr. Isa, ang siguro ang, uh, you know, something good about what you said is that Karamihan naman talaga ay mild. So, you know, um, konti lang naman talaga ang malala. Pero ganun pa man, dapat mag-iingat kasi nga pwede siyang mag-spread. Napakabilis niyang mag-spread. At um, siguro pwede natin yung pag-usapan din kasi hindi naman talaga lahat ay may, may low risk at high risk, di ba? So, para sa mga nununood natin, kasi sila naman, karamihan dito ay probably hindi high risk. But then, pwede mo lang bang mabangkit sa amin yung uh, in general, ano ang low risk at high risk para yung mga nakikinig, hindi naman sila magpapanik pag narinig nila yung ating pinag-uusapan? So, gaya na nabanggit ko kanina, diba? uh, majority or 80% mild illness na yung nararamdaman. So, yun yung konting uh, ubo, lagnat, parang sore throat. No? Uh, sa mga young and healthy, usually in one week, mararamdaman na nila na nagre-recover na sila, no? nag improve may improvement na. Pero yung mga elderly, yung 60 and above, yung mga may comorbid condition or may mga ibang sakit kagaya ng diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, may HIV or cancer, sila yung mas uh, at risk na magkaroon ng moderate or severe or critical illness na tinatawag. So, sila yung dapat na babantayan. Kaya dapat papakiramdaman mo uh, kung yung cough na yan ay hindi nawawala or mas nag-worsen or mas nahihirapan kang huminga. Usually during the second week, eh, by the, pag yung nararamdaman mo na hindi nawawala yung ubo, lagnat, mas nahihirapan kang huminga or sumasakit ang dibdib, dapat magkonsulta nasa doktor para ma- pa- ma-admit no or tawag kayo sa Barangay Health Emergency Response Team para ma-transfer na kayo sa 
COVID Referral Hospital. <clears throat> Ito rin yung mga, pag nag, ang ina-advise namin na kailangan talaga ma-admit no, yung mga elderly at saka merong mga comorbid condition or may mga ibang sakit na nabanggit ko nga gaya ng diabetes or hypertension. So sila, mas ang priority na ina-admit natin para ma-monitor kung magpo-progress yung kanilang uh, sakit or yung, kung magpo-progress yung COVID-19 to a moderate, severe, or critical stage. So maganda na nasa ospital sila para mabandayan. Okay, so mga nakikinig, ha? majority ay 80% ay mild, pero kapag ikaw may tinatawag ng comorbid, dapat talaga eh, mas, mas nag-iingat ka. Uh, nabanggit mo kanina, Dr. Isa, na napakabilis ang kanyang pagkalat. No? Sabi mo nga, you know, makagkaroon kang dalawa, apat, hanggang mamaya, buong komunidad na, buong barangay na. Uh, ito kayo tinatawag kasi pandemic. Eh. Pwede mo pang ipaliwanag lang sa amin, ano ba difference ng epidemic sa pandemic? Yung pandemic kasi, the term pandemic, it just, it's a term which refers to the spread of the disease. No? Um, pan, tinatawag na siyang pandemic pag it's has spread across all continents in the world. Yung, uh, yung COVID-19, nagsimula siya as an epidemic sa China. Tinatawag natin mo ng epidemic pag yung biglang dumami yung number of cases from the usual and uh, for example yung dengue no ang naghanap yan dito sa bansa natin no pero kung bawa meron tayong tinatawag na surveillance system no pag pwedeng kasi reportable disease yan kapag sabang mino-monitor yan ng ating Department of Health no ng ating mga municipal health officers Pag nakita natin na it's higher than the usual, than the, yung, yung tawag natin kasi yung usual, yung endemic, no? pangkaraniwa natin yan nakikita, pag tumaas siya ng more than the usual, then noon na tayo nag-alert na baka may outbreak or may epidemic. So yung nangyari sa China, uh, sa Wuhan, uh, initially, nakita, uh, napansin nung isang doktor doon na dumadami yung mga pasyente na may severe respiratory syndrome or severe respiratory illness at dumadami yung nasa ICU. Tapos initially, na-pick up nila na karamihan sa kanila ay na-expose sa Wuhan Seafood Market. Tapos noon, uh, after that, so unusual din yung presentation nung uh, respiratory illness na yun. Ibig sabihin, hindi siya yung pangkarinaywa namin nakikita na respiratory illness na alam namin na due to bacteria or yung mga virus na alam na ito, parang kakaiba. So, yun yung nagre-raise ng alert na baka may epidemic na tapos kasi biglang dami, tapos uh, iba yung presentation. Tapos kagaya nito, nung after nung un- makita nila na hindi up uh, meron ng mga pasyente na kahit wala sa Wuhan, ay kahit hindi nagpunta sa seafood market, ay nagkaroon din ng uh, infection. Meaning, yung mga na-expose dito sa pasyente na to na kasambahay, nagkaroon na rin. So, doon nila nakita na meron ng person-to-person spread. So, nag-declare na ng epidemic. Tapos noon, uh, so because of uh, easy travel din, so kumalat na siya sa ibang bansa. So nagkaroon tayo, yung first case natin was in February. And ang um, yung first three cases natin, tinatawag natin important cases, na galing sa Wuhan. So kumalat siya, tapos so, and then nagkaroon na rin sa US, South Korea, unti-unti, di ba? Dumami na sa Japan hanggang sa na-declare na siya na pandemic kasi nga kalat na siya sa buong mundo. So yun yung oh, Dr. Is. Uh, pandemic. Thank you. So uh, you know, it's very good information to find out, to know that uh, uh, the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic. You know, in the recent papers, um, uh, the newspapers, we have been reading about the Spanish flu. Uh, according to the papers, the last pandemic was actually the Spanish flu of 1918. Can you tell us a little about the this uh, pandemic? And uh, 
can we learn from uh, uh, from that pandemic in 1918? Okay. Um, yung, the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, no? the reason why we're parang trying to uh, go back to history is because the scope of the COVID-19 pandemic now is somewhat similar to uh, the scope that uh, occurred no? when uh, the Spanish flu was declared as a pandemic in uh, 1918. So in 1918, the Spanish flu also spread across continents, no? from America, Europe, Asia. And uh, at that time also, there was no treatment or vaccine available, no? which led to really a significant number of lives lost during the Spanish flu pandemic. And uh, as we all know, that pandemic affected almost 500 million people and about 50 to 100 million people died. Yun yung, uh, kaya siya parang, we're all, parang we're equating or trying to compare the current pandemic to the Spanish flu. And also during that time, similar. Dahil nga wala pang, wala ding gamot, walang vaccine. The people during that time also tried various remedies, like they also tried to gargle garlic mouthwash. And that time they tried mega doses of aspirin, naman, which probably aggravated the illness and contributed to the deaths. And uh, to control that pandemic, they also implemented quarantine and isolation measures similar to what we're doing now kasi nga hindi na at that wala ngang vaccine at saka walang gamot so ganun uh, pinagbawal din ang mass gathering schools were closed so you, people were not allowed to go out unless uh, it's essential so yun yung similarity between uh, the Spanish flu and the COVID-19 pandemic that we are experiencing now so the scope of the uh, the disease is almost the same in terms of numbers. And so, so are there any are there any I mean I mean of course we did the quarantine we did we're doing the quarantine right now but then um, how long did it last and are there any other lessons that we can pick up from that pandemic that yeah. we can apply to our current situation right now? Or is the world so different? Uh, the pandemic then lasted from 1918 to 1920, so it's much longer. Uh, and because they also experienced a second wave, you know, after they relaxed the quarantine measures, nagkaroon ng second wave. So it's probably, so that's something that we have to uh, learn from, you know, how to calibrate our uh, responses in terms of the uh, quarantine measures or the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we are implementing now to contain uh, and mitigate this uh, pandemic. Um, pero Dr. Isa, siyempre wala naman mga testing kits noon at that time. No? I mean, how did they diagnose the cases at that time? Was it all clinical at that uh, in 1918? Yeah, it was all clinical. That's it. Uh, that's why I think it lasted more, no? Kasi nga, wala, wala pa talaga ng masyadong research, wala pa yung mga diagnostic tests, and wala rin treatment talaga silang na-discover pa at that time. So, kaya mas matagal, I think, yung duration ng pandemic. So, when did the, when did the treatment... Uh... Uh, was a, a treatment discovered uh, at what point in the history were we able to put a, uh, a treatment to this kind of flu? Yung acertamibir na ginagamit natin ngayon was only in already in 2000, early 2000 that we were able to discover acertamibir. And then yung vaccine naman. And maraming klaseng vaccine na, na developed good time and it's only in 
think yeah, two thousand that we really were able to produce uh, effective, a cost-effective vaccine. Yeah. Uh, binibigay na natin ngayon year yearly, yeah. di ba? So, yeah. So, so I mean, the world is different now. We're lucky because we have uh, we have research, and uh -huh. as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Isa is part of a big uh, research. Uh, is a participant in a big research involving countries around the world. So, research is important. Number two, we have technology in our hands. We have uh, testing kits now. We're able to make diagnosis without getting the full blown picture of the patient. So we're hoping that uh, this one will not last that long. We're hoping that we're not going to wait for two years before it, it really goes, uh, goes away. Uh, you mentioned the second wave, so I understand uh, uh, we have to watch out for the second wave. Sabi mo nga, kailangan natin i-calibrate, no? But calibrating will really talk about um, making the right decision on, uh, or making the right assessment kung kailan magpa-flatten ng curve, you know. Uh, laging pinag-uusapan kasi ngayon ang second wave, nabanggit mo na yon pero pinag-uusapan din kasi ngayon yung uh, flattening the curve so that we know when to start opening the doors uh, of businesses and schools and so on. So maybe you can tell us a little about flattening the curve. Ano ba itong naririnig natin, pinag-uusapan? Kailangan talaga mag-flatten ang curve. Okay. Siguro, I'll start off with uh, the rationale why uh, bakit tayo nag-implement ng enhanced community quarantine or actually it's a term that we use para uh, hindi masyadong uh, nakakatakot sa tao kasi pag sinabing lockdown. Diba? Yung, so ang ginamit na term ay enhanced community quarantine and the uh, Main objective na is because we did not we do not have a vaccine or a treatment for this uh, virus is to uh, implement physical distancing measures and enhanced uh, protective measures para madelay yung peak ng epidemic to reduce transmission. Why do we want to reduce the transmission? Uh, Kasi nga, we all know already, we have seen no, in China that the, uh, the exponential growth of the uh, disease because of its high reproductive rate, so two to four yung reproductive rate na. In, so it's a fast pandemic. If you pick very fast, it will also end very fast, but at the expense of losing lives because your health system will not be able to uh, cope with that surge of cases. So what we wanted when we did, when we, the government imposed the enhanced community quarantine measure is to reduce the transmission of uh, cases. So you prevent people from going out you lessen their chances of being exposed, you lower the risk of transmission, you lower the average viral load. And with that, you lower the number of cases, uh, you, you blunt supposedly the peak. Instead of having a sharp peak, you uh, slower, you uh, pre uh, lower the spread of the virus. So you have lower number of cases, less severe infection, less infectious cases. So, bababa yung, it's not necessarily bababa, pero hindi siya magpipi, mas mahaba nga lang ang bago natin ma totally control yung uh, virus. So yun yung ibig sabihin natin na we are flattening the curve. If you are able to flatten the curve, you are slowing down the spread of the virus. At the same time, you are buying time for the health system to be capacitated. Because uh, when we, so if we look at our epidemic curve, we started off with first three cases na imported no, in February. And then in March, when we started seeing uh, Para localized transmission already, yung first two cases natin sa Green Hills. And then, uh, 
uh, our private hospitals then are starting to see also more cases of uh, COVID-like uh, illnesses, no? So, meron tayong criteria no, no? The fever, respiratory symptoms, and then history of travel. And then we were also able to find out that some of the cases did not really have history of travel. So, that signaled to us that there is some local transmission already going on. And that alerted us really, that we really need to uh, be more aggressive in our containment measures. Because at that point, when the number of cases were starting to increase, our hospitals were already uh, experiencing difficulty accommodating the number of cases going into the ER. And then we only have one laboratory, the National uh, Laboratory, that's our RITM. And the number of specimens coming in are increasing and then the turnaround time is getting longer. So with that, you are prolonging the stay of the patients in the hospital. So we are seeing already some a strain into the health system capacity. So that is why then we recommended that we have to really now uh, impose the ECQ so that we can slow down the spread of the virus and allow our health system to be able to uh, cope with the increasing number of cases. Alam mo, napakahalaga, no? I think that's very important, no? We hear um, flattening of the curve, you know, asking uh, the, the, the experts, have we reached our peak? And as you said, the reason we want to slow down the transmission is because we want to make sure that the health system can actually cope. Because uh, as you said, if the peak happens too fast, then we're going to lose too many lives. And um, so it's really a balancing act, no? Hindi siya pwedeng para bang you want to get all the cases and then get out. It doesn't work that way. So and that was the, that's the reason why I think, you know, the, uh, the peop the, uh, our... Department of Health is working closely with our experts and also with our epidemiologists to make sure that we are able to come up with a balancing act. Well, fortunately now we have more laboratories, but I think we need more. Uh, we have we started really with just one and we couldn't cope, but I know that now we have about 20 and I know that the Department of Health is trying to open up some more labs in other parts of the country. So you actually mentioned ECQ and we're about to implement the GCQ. So can you just give us the, the difference between an ECQ and a GCQ? Yeah. Um, we're now in ECQ, no? So ECQ, uh, we the prohibit mass gatherings, schools are closed, uh, work is also closed except for essential services, no? health, food, then travel also is uh, restricted. Our public transportation is not operating. Uh, in GCQ, you are slowly opening up. Why is that so? No? Kasi, uh, we need to be able to, at some point, start opening up. If you see that there is already flattening of the curve, and that the health system is also able already to manage the number of cases. Because uh, ECQ, as you have seen, has consequences. No? There's loss of income, loss of savings, businesses uh, are also suffering. So there is uh, collateral damage to that. We cannot go on ECQ forever. ECQ is not the cure to the disease. Uh, and I said, because we have to calibrate, now, if we see that there is already some flattening of the curve in terms of the number of new cases, and the other indicator also is if the number of deaths are also flattening. So that means uh, the quality of care probably is already uh, improving. The system is able to cope. Or, and uh, the public is now more aware that they have to consult earlier. So <clears throat> you now uh, reduce the delay 
in consultation because we saw that in the early part of the uh, our epidemic that there was a delay in consultation so we had a, a higher number of deaths during that time so we also look at the doubling rate no how how fast are, do we double our cases and that at the time that we implemented the ECQ, our doubling rate, our cases double every three days. Now we are seeing a slowing down of the doubling rate, meaning we are now able to, <clears throat> there is reduced transmission. So the doubling rate now is about five days no? compared to the three days before. So kaya nakikita na natin na medyo nagpa-platin na. And uh, that gives us now some confidence that we can probably open up, uh, open transportation, but still maintain the principle of physical distancing, uh, implementing personal protective measures. No, hindi ibig sabihin na pag inopen na magwawala na tayo, lalapas na tayo lahat. No, so hindi ibig hindi ibig sabihin na wala ng kaso. There are still cases that still need to be managed um it's that it's just that it is now hopefully at a manageable rate even the r not the reproductive rate na initially two to four during the time that we had our ecq now it has gone down to 1.1 to 1.2 so it's like for every one infect person that's infected you infect another one the effective r not is uh, it if it comes down to less than one, then it means you are, have started to control already the pandemic. So, sa, yun yung sa GCQ. So, pwede nang mag-operate yung transportation, but still maintaining physical distancing. Then yung uh, work, there are industries now that can be allowed to open as long as uh, they are able to maintain yung minimum health standards such as <clears throat> physical distancing. So yung work shifts should be uh, managed in such a way that you are able to implement physical distancing, personal protective measures, and then uh, proper ventilation in the office, regular disinfection of the workspace, toilets, pantries. So those are, and then uh, being able to screen also your workers. No, uh, it has to be made sure that the workers do not have fever, cough when they come in. So, meron ka rin parang screening symptom, you need to have a clinic that will be able to handle uh, symptomatic workers. Oh, Dr. Isa, definitely, it's a new normal. You know, I, I think everybody's talking about the new normal. So, so I'd like to ask you this time, even on a personal note, um, you're a practicing uh, uh, ex, uh, specialist in the field of infectious diseases. You see these patients every day. But what is what will be new normal for you as a doctor right now? Uh, so, because I'm in an infectious disease uh, specialist, no? so we're really always uh, conscious of protecting ourselves. So we do hand washing. The, for now, the, it will be enhanced uh, personal protective measures because, uh, again, we still do not have the uh, vaccine, the treatment. Kaya we advise uh, people to still wear masks. So we have to wear masks in our clinic. Because of that, uh, what I described earlier, the pre-symptomatic period na two days before you have the symptoms, pwede ka nang kahawa. So, as an extra precaution, you'll have to wear mask. You know? And then, always uh, hand washing before and after handling the patient. And then, uh, and then if you are going to perform procedures that will generate aerosol, that is the time that you will have to wear N95. And uh, now, because we try to limit contact no, uh, or face-to-face -face, uh, transactions, there is now also the use of telemedicine, no, wherein you do your consults by phone. I used to not uh, like that. I prefer really face-to-face -face contact. But now I think there will be really opportunities. No, uh, it has now become important no, to use this technology of telemedicine. 
especially yeah, if you are uh, patients, we have to travel far, then it can be an effective tool to provide, still to continue to provide uh, health service to your to our patients. So yan, yung telemedicine ang para magiging mas bago na uh, strategy for to in this new normal. PGH is getting ready for uh, launching telemedicine and its outpatient department. Um, whether we like it or not, we have to reach out to our patients. Thousands of patients in our outpatient department and PGH at pinagahandaan na yun ngayon. So that means both in the government hospitals as well as the private hospitals, telemedicine will be part of our life. We'll have to use technology for ourselves. Napangkasi the use of the mask, no? So I just want to, um, and you know, if you look at the the the, the features on Wuhan now, even if uh, it's gone, the people are still wearing masks. So is this something that we foresee to happen here in the Philippines? That even if let's say the virus is gone away, uh, we'll still be wearing masks. Yeah. Uh, I think because so if you look at the culture of Japan, you know, they did not actually implement uh, this lockdown because they have really this culture of having a distance and then. When they greet people, it's they bow and not they are not touchy persons. And if you see them in the train, they actually wear masks if they have cough or colds. Because dapat naman talaga na yun yung si culture na kailangan nating imbibe in this new normal is being conscious of uh, yun na, yung cup etiquette, not spitting in the public, and if you have cough and colds, wear mask and consult or stay at home do not go to work so yun yung mga measures that we have now to be aware of as a person to be conscious of this uh, health measure preventive health measures hand washing cup etiquette not spitting in the public wear mask if you are sick so that will be uh, the new norm that we will see and then, uh, and then the, our uh, environment also, no? Dapat we will, should be able to provide adequate supply of soap and water, tapos regular cleaning of our public uh, space, public facilities, workspaces. Yan, regular maintenance. What we started in this COVID pandemic should continue, should be sustained so that... Uh, that health consciousness, the culture of being clean and healthy will stay. Because prevention is really treatment. It's the first thing in infectious diseases, being able to uh, adapt these preventive measures. No, Dr. Isa, no, ang sabi mo nga eh, the new norm is that uh, um, we have to make sure proper etiquette of cough and uh, uh, protecting others when we are sick. COVID or not COVID, that has to be the new norm. Yes. Um, can you just uh, uh, repeat the part about infectiousness? Kasi alam mo, mga tao, kailangan talaga, ang crucial na nilang maalala talaga is, paano ba makakahawa itong COVID-19? Pakiulit lang nun, kasi yun natang ang isa sang mensahe na dapat nating maparating sa ating mga viewers ngayon. Close contact with someone who has the virus uh, through droplets. No? Yung, when you cough or sneeze, then you spread the virus to someone who is close to you, three feet. With, if you do not cover your cough or you do not uh, practice the proper cough etiquette, proper sneezing etiquette, then you will be spreading the virus through droplet spread. So, Dr. Isa, um, uh, in our last few minutes of our conversation, you, you've ha you have many messages from our viewers. I'd like to request you to have a message for 
uh, maybe the top three messages for the general public. And then since you mentioned also uh, the need for um, preparing the environment and the, pub and the, the, the country in general, maybe a message that you can give to our policymakers. First, the top three messages for our general public. For the general public, we really need to have a healthy lifestyle. And uh, for us to be able to control this pandemic, discipline and cooperation in uh, implementing personal protective measures, uh, following physical distancing, that will help a lot uh, as we move from ECQ to GCQ and then as we relax. You know. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the personal protective measures, your hand hygiene, cup etiquette, and of course, do not stress yourself with misinformation. Uh, kailangan maging responsible tayo. Uh, set a time of the day that you will listen and to a credible TV station or read credible articles or journals. Wag tayong uh, be tempted to be to spread fake news. No? We have to be able to distinguish which is fake and which is true. Ngayon for our uh, uh, health workers naman then, uh, we have to continue this fight no? for against COVID-19. Uh, we have to work together in solidarity to be able to control this uh, pandemic. And as I always say, in infectious preventive health education is very important. And, uh, we should not forget that as clinicians, it's not just about the laboratory test. It has to be being uh, aware, uh, being astute and being able to uh, determine whether you are seeing a new case or a new disease. No? So, kailangan maging very alert tayo. We should not forget our clinical eye, clinic judgment. It's not just about the tests. The tests are important in an epidemic and in a surveillance because you will be able to monitor the numbers. Okay. And then uh, another thing is we have to adhere to guidelines uh, which are evidence-based and then we have to follow reporting standards as clinicians. No? We have to comply with reporting notifiable diseases so that we can monitor and uh, really determine if there is an increasing number of a new case or we are reaching an epidemic or an outbreak or we are controlling the disease. For our government, no. uh, the other message is uh, public health is everyone's business. Okay. And, uh, I think one of the lessons we've seen here in this pandemic is that we can see here that health is a valuable cost-effective investment. Okay. Uh, with the spread of this virus, we saw a lot of uh, losses, economic losses. So we, we can see here that if we invest in our health system, we invest in the health of our population can probably uh, prevent another type of, another epidemic or pandemic. So uh, these minimum health standards that we are now imposing, if we implement that seriously and we monitor it, it will go a long way, not just for COVID, but for other diseases. And this is also now the time that we can can in preventive health changes part of our universal health care. So this will be the for us now to uh, start implementing universal health care and start with preventive health packages. Then uh, we need to uh, to have an or expand and have an effective surveillance them with timely contact tracing and a responsive laboratory. So this is now the time to really make good use of technology so that we can easily monitor you know, if we have increasing number of cases. So we need to work together across all sectors, both public and private, the academe. You know, so bayanihan para sa bayan. We have to continue the full of society approach, full of government, full of system approach for a healthy nation. We look forward to another, another episode with you.
it seems like we need another episode just to talk about the new things that will happen months from now. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Chancellor Menchi. The clarity needed to fight this invisible enemy is important. Recommendations based on evidence and expertise will guide us through these uncertain times. We stand with the world, forging our future to fight this enemy and delivering health for all. Good day to our viewers. This is Dr. Menchit Padilla, Kalusugan Ay Karapatan.